Now, uh, it might be possible that, uh, so uh, it might be possible that I might have a little nosebleed. I just had that a little while ago. So I don't want the audience to freak out and say, oh my goodness, he's got, he's got a plague, he's dying. So, uh, so I, just, uh, I just took it out of my nose now. So I don't know if it'll bleed in the middle. If it does that, I don't want onliners to freak out. Okay, all right. Uh, my voice is almost back 100%, so we'll see what happens. So, like the people already know, it's just that uh, I'm overexhausted. It's been a very busy couple weeks. Uh, a lot of people have saw the online videos too, so I was incredibly busy. So, uh, my voice got tired out and gave up the ghost, and then I guess uh, my nose did too. So, <laughs> that's why some blood came out. But anyway, uh, I've been getting a lot of rest. So I know people are trying to recommend me take this supplement, that one, and then trying to get me to rest. I just want to let people know that uh, I appreciate how much you care about me, but I also want you to know that I am doing that. So I've been taking a lot of rest in between, Amen. okay? So I want people to do that. If you kind of keep, uh, it's, I know that you're not pushing or pressuring me, but if you keep you know, telling me to rest or take the supplement, it's causing me more pressure, you know? <laughs> So it's giving me uh, more stress, you know. So I just want the people to understand that, okay? So the best you can help me is just to pray for me, okay? I'd really appreciate that and just supporting me, that's all. So uh, let's start out with Genesis chapter 12. We left off at verse 3. The Bible says, so God is speaking to Abraham, and he gave a promise to Abraham and to his seed and his children. The most controversial virtual passage that changed all of history, mm -hmm. and even churches today have a problem with this passage. In verse three, and I will bless them that bless thee. Yeah. So God, uh, I'm going to explain each and every word, Amen. because remember, this is word for word, Bible study. So I'm going to explain every word here. So the verse points out that God says, I'm going to bless those people, Abraham, uh, that uh, bless you. I'm going to bless those. And curse, and curse him that curseth thee. He's going to curse those who curse Abraham and his seed in return. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So God said that uh, in Abraham, all the people on the earth, families of the earth, are going to be blessed from Abraham. So any family that supports Abraham and his children, they will be supported in return by the Father. But those that curse will be cursed in return. Now, this is a very controversial passage. Mm -hmm. right. So then the question is, who are the people that we're blessing and who are the people that we're cursing? So we believe that it is the nation of Israel. So I know a lot of people don't like the current nation of Israel today. And there is no doubt that the current nation of Israel is in a very wicked state. Some parts in Israel can be even more liberal than the most liberal cities in America. So I can recognize that. However, you have to understand that uh, you have to go by what the scripture says and not how you feel or how you see things. Mm -hmm. What does God say in his word? Facts are facts. The Bible says that Abraham's children, that they are the ones getting blessed. Now, the modern nation of Israel, they are the seed of Abraham. Now, there are arguments against it. There's known as the British Israelite movement. Uh, you also have a lot of people called replacement theology. And then other people who claim that the Jews are not genuine Jews, but they are Khazars. And that these are known as fake Jews. So there's a lot of arguments against the Jewish people. Whenever you see a lot of arguments arising, then you have to bet your bottom dollar somewhere that this is something that gets the devil's attention. Oh, yeah. And he wants to cause a lot of confusion. So it is very important to understand that just because there's a lot of confusion about this nation 
you don't automatically dismiss it and say these are not God's chosen people. When there's more confusion, it should make you more wary of studying and saying the enemy wants to attack this group of people. So that's something to understand. Now, we're going to cover the scriptural passages that point out that uh, this promise goes to the modern nation of Israel today. First of all, let's see that promise repeated at Genesis 27. Genesis chapter 27. Notice that promise is repeated to Jacob and his seed, his descendants. Genesis chapter 27, notice in verse 29. Let people serve thee, and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be every one that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. Amen. So Jacob's descendants receive that too. That whoever blesses uh, the nation of Israel, Jacob's descendants will be blessed, cursed, then they get cursed. Now notice that these promises, there's no condition in there. These are unconditional promises. Right. Now a lot of people, what they like to point out is, they like to point out that no, there were... Uh, conditions laid out and they'll point out Abraham when he got circumcised they'll point out Moses where God made promise that were conditional but this is very important to understand what's important to understand is that when Abraham got circumcised that wasn't until years later <coughs> because God he was making uh, when he made a promise to Abraham he didn't just make one promise. He gave many blessings and promises to Abraham. So it is very important to understand that when God gave the promise uh, to Abraham about uh, through circumcision, that one was conditional at a later chapter, later time period. What we're looking at has no conditions when we looked at Genesis 12. When uh, you look at Jacob's promise, Jacob, you think that this is a guy that followed conditions for the Lord very well. No, he was a wicked person. He lied, he deceived his older brother, and God sure dealt with him. But Jacob, nevertheless, received the promise. So you have to understand that the nation of Israel, the promise they received of the blessings and cursings are unconditional. Now look at Numbers, Numbers 24. And then we'll read verse 9. The promise is repeated again, and this is through a false prophet named Balaam. But then he was uh, pressured and got the fear of the Lord, so he had to preach the right things and cannot curse Israel, no matter how wicked they are. He had to say good things about them. Verse 9. He couched, he lay down as a lion, and as a great lion, who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesseth thee, and cursed is he that curseth thee. So notice right here that promise is repeated. But uh, for those who argue, well, I am a Jew. No, you're not. The Jew is referring to a physical ethnicity. That's right. So as much as you would like to put, no, it's based on conditions or it's based on some spiritual transaction. That's not true. It's all ethnic. Yeah. It's physical ethnicity. Uh, for those of you who doubt it, you just read the verse prior, okay? You think this is a condition or something that's a spiritual transaction or a literal physical people as a nation. Look at the previous verse. God brought him forth out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn, he shall eat up the nations, his enemies. So notice right here that God promised that Israel, as a nation, it will conquer other enemies. And not only that, you're not the ones that came out of Egypt. So this is a historical group of people that's real, physical, ethnic. Let's look at Romans 9. Romans 9. 
and look at Romans chapter 9. Now, some people are going to point out passages that, well, Israel is not really Israel anymore. And they're going to point out New Testament passages. They're going to point out that was in the Old Testament where Israel was physical, ethnic, but then today it's a spiritual group of people. Well, there's a partial truth in there. And remember, the devil, when he gives a lie, it's always a partial truth. Yeah. You have to understand that. So in the New Testament, it is true that the nation of Israel is a spiritual nation, and that's referring to the Christian church. But hold the phone there. Just because God did that, that doesn't mean that God completely annihilated and forgot this physical ethnicity. You have to understand that in the New Testament, it's a spiritual group of people, which is the nation of Israel. We'll admit that, and I'm going to show you verses. However, God did not forsake this physical ethnicity. It's still ongoing. As a matter of fact, he can... He temporarily places them aside, but he still recognizes that you are my people yeah. and I'm going to restore you in That's the future. Right. Now, if you doubt that, that the physical ethnicity, that uh, God still recognizes them as his people, then you're not reading. Look at Romans 9. Look at verse 3. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ. Now that means lost. That means damned to hell. A curse from Christ. So Paul says that he wished he could go to hell for who? For my brethren. So for his own brethren. Why? That's not saved Christians. To say that uh, this is referring to saved Christians who are spiritual Jews. No, you can't say that. Otherwise you're saying saved Christians go to hell. So this is a different group of people. What did Paul say? My brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. That's very plain. It's a physical group of people, Jews. Look at verse 4. Who are Israelites? That's plain. So Jews are fleshly group of people. They're not just some spiritual church. That's right. Like you're going to see all over online that they try to promote this heresy. Keep reading. To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory, and the what? Covenants. covenants. So when God gave that covenant to Abraham, I'll bless you, bless you, curse them that curse you, that covenant is still ongoing for the nation of Israel. Yeah. God recognizes that. And the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom as concerning the flesh. See? Physical group of people. Christ came who is over all, God bless forever, amen. So that's very plain. Now those who are replacement theology, and there are Calvinists who do not agree with this dispensational teaching. That's why dispensationalism is so important. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, you can watch my video, Amazing Dispensational Truth, from Genesis to Revelation. I even have a booklet on Amazon, Kindle. Uh, you can get that or watch it for free and then study this. It's so important to understand this. Amen. Calvinists do not believe in this teaching. Those who are anti-dispensational or do not believe what I just mentioned is verse 6. This is what they're going to concentrate. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. So that's what uh, the anti-people uh, anti will proclaim. They're going to claim See, not all Jews are Jews. Now, what they overlook, which I pointed out to you, remember, in the New Testament, we recognize it. There are spiritual Jews. Now, if you are a physical, ethnic Jew, but you rejected Jesus Christ and you don't have him as your personal savior, you are not a spiritual Jew. You're not a child of God. And when we say child of God, we mean spiritually. But when we talk about uh, God's people, God's children or chosen nation, we mean that in a physical sense for the Jews. Yeah. But at the same time, they're not God's children mm -hmm. spiritually. Amen. 
You might say, how is that possible? It's simple. You just rightly divide. The fleshly side, they are God's chosen nation yeah. as a nation. But spiritually, they're dead in sin. They're the children of the devil. That's right. So that's why Paul says they're not all Israel which are of Israel because he's focusing on a spiritual aspect. Now, if you think that I'm being double-minded right here and this doesn't make any sense, I don't think so. Paul was thinking this double mindset. He was rightly dividing the two. And I'm going to prove it with the next verses. Keep reading. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. Now, did you read that? Yeah. Did you read that? See, Paul had a double mindset. He said that, he recognized verse 7, that they are the seed of Abraham. But he doesn't, uh, but he points out that in Isaac's seed, spiritually speaking, that they don't qualify because, keep reading, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Uh, you'll notice right here that Paul, he points out that those who are based off the flesh, based off the flesh, that uh, they're not counted. Why? Because Paul is only looking at a spiritual plane right here. But then he's contradicting himself when you read uh, verse 3, right? That he recognizes that the children of the flesh, that they receive the promises. What's the simple answer? The simple answer is just rightly divide. Yeah. Flesh. They are God's promise, children, and etc. But on this side right here, spiritually, they are not promised. They are not God's children. Amen. Paul's looking at a spiritual plane here. So you have to look at the spiritual aspects, but they don't concentrate on that. All right? We're also going to look at Romans 11. Romans 11. And then we're going to look at Romans 4. Let me show you a better one. We have Romans 11 and Romans 4. These are more strong. This points out right here that Abraham is their father, the Jews. They are descendants of Abraham physically. But spiritually, God does not count it because they don't accept by faith Jesus Christ. All right, let me show you two powerful passages. First of all, Romans 4. We'll look at uh, verse 9. Verse 9. Come at this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Now, did you notice what Paul pointed out here? He said that Abraham, yes, he's the father spiritually of spiritual Jews, which is the Christian church. Yeah. But he said not only, yeah. right? Abraham's the father of two areas, physically, the circumcised Jews, and those who are uncircumcised spiritually, say Christian. But this gets even worse for our adversaries. Look at verse 12, 12. And the father, that's Abraham, right? Of what? Circumcision, circumcision to them who are not of the what? Circumcision. circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of the what? Faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet what? Uncircumcised. Un verse 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Because why? Paul is focusing right here on New Testament Christian salvation. That's why these uh, Jews physically don't qualify as spiritual Jews, Abraham's seed. But Paul even though he's focusing on that fact that Jews are not really Jews, so to speak, in the spiritual plane, he recognized that those Jews are nevertheless Jews, physically. Look at verse 16. Therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace, which the physical Jews didn't receive, right? To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not, so who's Abraham's seed? Not to only which is of the law. Oh, boom, right there. See, Jewish law. 
See, they're a seed of Abraham, but also the what? But to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. That's very powerful. Amen. Now, the uh, replacement theology, they like to concentrate on verse 13, 14, 15. But they didn't read the whole passage. If they read the whole passage, they would approve dispensationalism. That, yeah, Jews are not really Jews as God's spiritual family, yeah. but God recognized it that these physical Jews, that they're still God's chosen nation physically, Amen. if they read the whole thing. That proves our two teachings right Amen. here, that there is a uh, displacement of Jews as a nation temporarily. Why? Because God is focusing on, focusing on a spiritual plane. Nevertheless, God does not discount their physical side. Yeah. Now, Romans 11 is very plain, and you heard me like chant Romans 11 nonstop, but it bears repeating. It's so powerful. People don't get it. Romans 11. Verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God what? Forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. That's very plain. He's talking about physical, ethnic side right here. God's not done with them. Replacement theology, they like to focus on verse 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Why? Because Jew Israel is not really Israel because they didn't receive Christ for salvation. Again, they're focusing on the spiritual side, and we recognize that, yeah. but they didn't focus on the physical. Look at verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise, in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. So notice right here, in part, it's partial. God blinds it out, yeah. all right? Israel is blinded out until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. See, until a specific time period. Amen. So God's going to restore the nation of Israel in the future Amen. because you got tons of one of, the, <clears throat> one of the number one uh, topics that you'll find in the Bible that's mentioned is the restoration of the nation of Israel. Yes, sir. I mean, you read Isaiah, Jeremiah, the Minor Prophets, Psalms, even some verses in the New Testament, it's filled. Mm -hmm. To reject that doctrine is to reject what God pays attention to one of the most yeah. in the Bible. That's right. Isn't that pretty serious? Yeah. So that's why we're not anti-Semite, all right? We have to be careful of that, all right? If God pays special attention on something, you should pay special attention to not reject it, yeah. not criticize it. Now, if you keep reading, verse 26, so all Israel shall be saved. So God recognizes the nation, the holistic nation of Israel will be restored in the future. It says shall be saved. See that? So it's a national salvation in the future. Verse 27, he made a covenant that he's going to take away the sins of that nation. So yeah, they commit a lot of sin right now, but God's going to take it away in the future. Verse 28, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. We recognize that. They are enemies spiritually, against the gospel, spiritually. But look, as touching the election, see, they're still elect. If you elect someone, you chose someone. Right. So they're still chosen people. They are beloved for the who? Father's, Father's sake. See, <laughs> their physical, ethnic side, forefathers' sides. Verse 29, for the gifts and calling of God are what? With, he are without repentance. God cannot change his mind. That's right. Now, this is unbreakable. So stay away from people who try to attack the nation of Israel. Very good advice. Amen. Okay, I know all the conspiracy theories in there, and the nation of Israel is messed up, but let me tell you something. That's not new. Did you read from Genesis to Revelation? Israel sinned. 
They sacrificed babies to false gods. That's really wicked. But guess what? God's promise is still on them. Now, if you insist that, no, they're so evil so they cannot be God's people, then I'd like to ask you this. Then who is God's people? Who is Israel? People say, I am, I am. There's so many people who want to be a Jew. Let's take it for granted that you are the real Jew, so to speak. Are you telling me you're not wicked yourself? Yeah. There's that pride mentality right there. There's that pride mentality. When you've got to recognize all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Another thing you have to realize is when the Bible says about bless, bless, and curse, curse, this does not mean that uh, we support Israel on its wrong politics or anything like that. Now, there are some uh, Bible-believing Christians that they'll say they'll support Zionism and stuff like that. And, you know, I, sh I, tend, I tend not to be overtly critical. I know what they mean by that. What they mean by that is based on the promise, bless, bless, curse, curse. So then they don't want to be against the nation of Israel, uh, whatever it moves. But... This does not mean that I, as your pastor, or Bible believers, who might even proclaim to be Zionists, that they support everything that Israel decides, like their sodomite parade that goes on in Jerusalem. Yeah. Or you can get into complex issue about the Palestinians and all that kind of stuff. I know all that kind of stuff, guys. All right? You know what my simple answer to that is? My simple answer to that is this, is that you just simply... What we just simply do is go by the scriptures, okay? So if what Israel does is against the Bible, we obviously don't support that. Paul mentioned Romans 11, they are enemies on the spiritual side. So we never condone them for that. The prophets sure didn't. The New Testament preachers sure didn't. As a matter of fact, they preached hard against the Jews. But that does not mean that they declared a curse against them. That doesn't mean that they went on a jihad or a Catholic propaganda, a Nazi yeah. propaganda, or a mindset that was anti-Semite and attacked the Jews. No, they didn't do that. You know, what, uh, you know what Christians do? This is what Christians do. We let the Lord handle them. And trust me, if you study the history of the nation of Israel, they've been through enough. Yeah. And the tribulation is worse for them. Israel has seen nothing yet. What's its sin and its wickedness it's promoting right now? God's going to pay them back tenfold at the tribulation. And it's at that time Israel finally repents and gets right with God. Why? Because the tribulation is God's wrath. When God puts his wrath, that's bigger than Hitler's wrath. Yeah. That's bigger than the Roman Catholic Inquisition wrath. And then uh, any uh, uh, Islamic terrorist wrath, and etc. It's bigger than all that combined. Trust me, God will take care of his own people. You don't need to worry about them. If I were you, I'd worry about yourself. I'd worry about myself. I got too many problems myself. Yeah. All right? Yeah. Mind your own business, man. Yes, All right, go back to Genesis. That should have been very, very thorough. Go to Genesis 12. Genesis 12. And don't make me go all out. There's a billion arguments I know out there. Don't make me go all out, all right? I can go days on this topic, all right? This is just a handful. All right, let's go to Genesis 12. Now we'll look at verse 4. Verse 4. So uh, let me repeat verse 3 again. That way people can get the memo. When we bless the nation of Israel, we're going to bless them not concerning its sinful parts, okay? But we're going to bless them whenever God shows us where we can bless them. Why? Because we want to receive a blessing in return. I study the history of Israel, the people, the nations who supported the Jews, helped the nation of Israel. You'll see God's blessing upon them in return, consequently. But those who turned against the nation of Israel, you saw what happened to them. Look at the Nazi regime, gone. You see all these other people who turned against the Jews, gone. This group of people should be evidence yeah. that your Bible is true. Oh, yeah. I, I, the greatest evidence today... Now, you agnostic and atheist want to see that Bible being real is the nation of Israel. It's that simple. That Jew is something. God keeps preserving them. 
And they're going to try to prove us wrong one day by annihilating the Jews in the tribulation. No, we'll prove that book wrong. Let's annihilate the nation, <coughs> excuse me, the nation of Israel. You won't, no matter how much you try. All right, let's go to Genesis 12. Uh, sorry about that, because my nose was bleeding. It's all dry, so uh, the weather has been very cold and dry, so I have sensitive allergies about that one. So sorry about that for coughing. All right, so sometimes it might come out. Let's go to Genesis 12, verse 4. So Abraham departed, as that the Lord has spoken unto him. So Abraham, he left when God spoke to him. Uh, the promise, verse 1, 2, and 3, right? Abraham, get out. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. So Abraham did that, and Lot went with him. Ah, so Abraham, or Abram, and that's his name right now, didn't fully obey God's command. He took his nephew Lot with him. And Abraham was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Haran. So Abram was 75 years old uh, when he left Har uh, Haran, or Haran, however way you want to pronounce that. And we already covered this supposed uh, contradiction. So remember, there was a, a contradiction with how his father died and passed away. Because we were timing it by Abraham when he was 75 years old. But I already explained uh, and reconciled that contradiction, so it bears no repeating. So let's go back. So remember, Abram, he left Haran, okay, not Ur of the Chaldees, because he left that place a long time ago. So it's out of Haran. So he's continuing on. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, so Sarai, uh, Abram's wife, and Lot, his brother's son, so that means his nephew, brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered. So basically, every possession that they had, they gathered it together, they packed it up. And the souls that they had gotten in Haran, so uh, souls, uh, we're going to come to that later on if we do have time, but souls, it's very important to understand, that's the real you. So if it means the real you, then that means persons. Who is the real you? Who is the real person, right? So then that's why souls are known as persons. So when the Bible mentions that, Sometimes you're going to wonder, some of these passages, it doesn't make sense because we believe the soul is eternal and that uh, it's something inside our body. But a lot of times the verses won't point to that soul as a tangible, uh, a literal substance. A lot of times the Bible could be referring to it as simply as a person, as that aspect and context. So then it's not that Abraham gathered a bunch of souls together with him and then dragged them all out out of their body like it's some ghost or Casper he pulled out. It's more like a person he gathered. Now I'm going to show that a little bit later on. But as we keep reading, uh, he, so uh, he had a bunch of people with him in Haran. Now he took them with him because uh, during that time there were uh, people where you had uh, servants and you had people that you were in charge of. So Abram had that. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. So they went to Canaan, and they came to Canaan. Now remember, in Hebrews, Abraham did not know the land that he was in. But the Bible says that he went to Canaan. That does not mean that Abram knew he was going to Canaan. It's just simply the Holy Spirit giving an account where they went. But Abraham, it doesn't mean that Abraham has to know that. All right. Let's keep reading. Verse 6, And Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Sechem. So he passed through uh, that land when he was going through Canaan, and he came to Sechem unto the plain of Morah. So in these two passages, Sechem is referring to, believe it or not, Shechem. Okay, 
Now, if you know your Bible, she come later on in the Bible. But it was Sechem that time. Now, that's normal. During the ancient times, it was spelled differently. Why? Because of the language changes that time, cultural changes. As every generation passes by, uh, spelling changes throughout time. You'll notice that. The biggest uh, evidence is your Twitter feed now. All right, It's so bad that uh, you spell words so differently now compared to 10 years ago. The King James Bible went through uh, several editions. Why? Because of the spelling changes. That's normal. So there were spelling changes. So later on, you're going to see Shechem in your Bible. That's referring to the same place, Shechem. That means uh, shoulder. That means shoulder. So uh, Tom has a bad Shechem, you can say. All right, we've been praying for his Shechem. Okay. Now, they went to the plain of Mora, so that's where they went to. So the plain of Mora, Mora is referring, it means teacher. Abraham, as he continues on, verse 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, So God appeared to Abram again, and he's speaking to him. Unto thy seed will I give this land. So God gave a promise that I'm going to give this land to you, Abram. Uh, if we read back at verse 6, I didn't finish reading that. This is very important teaching. The last part of verse 6, and the Canaanite was then in the land. So the Canaanite was in this land when Abram went to. And God says, I'm going to give you this land. This is what I promised to you. Now, this is very important to understand. Notice there were people before Abram who lived in there. Yeah. But God says, no, that's not going to be their land. That's going to be your land, Abram. Now, the people, they're going to uh, argue about the Palestinians. They didn't get a fair share. And I'm not going to doubt that the Palestinians went through some kind of unfair share with the nation of Israel. But it can be said with the other side, too. One thing I learned about politics, both sides have problems. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the pointer. Just because you might argue the Palestinians were there first, well, one, no, they weren't there first. Who was before the Palestinians were the Jews, actually. Yeah. They just had to get their homeland back. They returned to their homeland. If you think that's unfair and, oh, no, that, that doesn't make sense, then why are you stupid Americans, liberals, arguing about you know, these black slaves, they didn't get their plantation, their lands. And there are cases where these uh, later generations of black people get some big plot of land or something like that. Because my ancestors worked hard and they were slaves. Oh, how about that? What about the Native Americans, huh? Yeah. Uh, see, you're picking and choosing. That's it. See, you're picking and choosing. That's pretty messed up. Now, what am I arguing right here? I'm arguing we're, we're not trying to go by this logic or this politic of who's there first gets first dibs. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the earth, if you have the mentality that this whole world belongs to God, not to you, then God has the right to give it to whoever he wants. Amen. And if God says that, hey, Abram, your children gets this land, they get it. Well, that's so sad about those uh, people who dwelt there first. Listen, man, you got to realize this, is that every nation goes through unfairness mm -hmm. without God. Yeah. So I'm not agreeing with the current political situation with Israel. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that the Palestinians, that uh, they're in the wrong, Israel is in the right, or Israel's in the wrong, Palestinians are right. I'm not getting that. I'm pointing out that there is no peace and no perfect politic. When man is by itself, and that includes the nation of Israel. But when God comes down on the earth and sets up his perfect government, he's going to give that plot of land to the nation of Israel. And by the way, all the other nations, they're not going to go through unfairness. They're all going to live happy lives. They're all, they're all going to have their own plot of land and etc. But I'll tell you who are the ones who are going to suffer the consequences, those who are not on God's side. See, that's what you're seeing right now. Nobody is on God's side right now. 
So because of that, it's natural you're going to get unfairness in politics, immigration, uh, land possession, and et cetera. You're going to get that. It's normal. So yeah, I'll even admit, Israel, they might do some unfair things against the Palestinians, but that's going to be normal when you're without God. Yeah. And by the way, it's going to be the same thing with the Palestinian side if they do their part and they win against the Jews on some things. It doesn't change that fact. So the point is this. The point is, is that God has to be in charge, obviously. Secondly, you have to understand that God don't care. Because notice right here, they were called Canaanites. You see that? Now, I don't believe in calling them Palestinian. I say that, you know, that way the people can better understand. But it's more accurate to, be, uh, to refer them as Ishmael's line or Arabs. I don't believe in calling them Palestinians because it seems to indicate that that's their land, Palestine. No, I don't believe that. I don't even believe in that word Palestine either. It should be Israel. But let's play their game. I don't care if it's, they're called Palestinians and it's called Palestine, hence Palestinians should have Palestine. No, notice Canaanites with Canaan. Yeah. But God don't think that that's their land. Yeah. Mm. So you have to look at the scriptures, what God thinks. Now look at what God looks at. God don't care about that. He still sees that as the Jews' land right there. So Canaan belongs to the nation of Israel. Now, as we keep uh, reading on here, the Bible says at the latter part of verse 7, And there builded he an altar unto the Lord. So Abram built an altar to God after God gave him that promise. Who appeared unto him. So the Lord appeared to Abram, obviously. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel. So Abram removed uh, himself all the way to a mountain. And this mountain was on the east of Bethel right here. So in this uh, side, this mountain, it's the east of Bethel. And it's on this side that he was... <coughs> he, <coughs> excuse me, he built up an altar uh, to worship the Lord. Now... As we keep reading onward, it says, uh, The east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. So Abram, uh, what he d was, was that he removed himself thence from the mountain that was east of Bethel, but then he pitched his tent where Bethel was directing toward his west side and Hai on the east. Now, Hai and Bethel, th these are the meanings right here. You're going to hear quite often people saying that uh, I want to go to my Bethel. And what they mean by that is house of God. Uh, let's put that here. Bethel means house of God. So if you hear that from people in the future, they're referring to that as uh, the house of God. As a haven, so to speak. They'll quite often refer to that. Hei is interesting. For some of you who didn't know, Hei, go to Joshua 8. That's Ai. Joshua 8. Now this is very interesting. Names are big in the Bible. Names have a reason behind it. Name of Hei or Ai, you know what it means? Rubble. Heap. Names have big importance, so... Be careful what you name. A lot of times those things could be true. All right, go to Joshua 8. Now notice right here that this is undoubtedly referring to Hai, which is close by Bethel. If you look at, uh, let's see right here. Verse 17, and there was not a man left in Ai or what? Bethel that went not out after Israel. So see, they're close by in directions. So Ai is undoubtedly the same Ai. If you keep reading, notice right here that uh, 
It's funny. Look at verse 29, uh, verse 28. And Joshua burnt Ai and made it a what? Heap forever. Verse 29. And the king of Ai, he hanged on a tree until eventide. And as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take his carcass down from the tree and cast it at the entering of the gate of the city and raise thereon a great heap of stones that remaineth unto this day. It's a great rubble. Now, this is very important to understand. Sometimes when you have names, it can have meanings. All right? When you put a name, it could have a meaning. So it is important to understand that. Uh, sometimes, uh, don't get me wrong, sometimes uh, when you delve into the conspiracy theories, they try to find uh, the meaning of the name Omicron or, you know, the C pandemic virus thing and then uh, Fauci and all that kind of stuff. And I, I can agree that you can carry that too far, but I don't dismiss it either. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, when you analyze the names, the Lord sees that as something else, it can have a meaning or a prediction in the future. Now you think about that one, all right? All right, go back. Genesis 12, Genesis chapter 12. <clears throat> uh, let's look at the latter part of verse 8. And there he built an altar unto the Lord. So you see, you see the picture, the drawing over here, that's what he did. And called upon the name of the Lord. So he built an altar for the Lord, and then he called upon the name of the Lord. Look at Romans 10, 13, Romans 10, 13. That should be very plain. Calling upon the name of the Lord is praying, okay? Now, you're going to see some people who are going to claim that call upon the name of the Lord is not praying, but it's just simply believing that's not true. When you look at call upon the name of the Lord throughout the Bible, you're going to see generally that it is referring to praying. So if somebody tries to draw on a whiteboard and then discourage you from using the sinner's prayer and say call upon the name of the Lord is believing it's not praying, and then they say stuff that praying doesn't save, it's an element of truth, but it's giving something that the devil would want. Yeah. And I've seen uh, that kind of teaching yeah. uh, burdening other Bible-believing churches and pastors. Yeah. And shame on those people who uh, teach that kind of stuff. So you have to understand this, is that when we do the sinner's prayer, there's nothing wrong with us doing that. That's right. Now, I do understand that praying doesn't say, we're not saying that every Catholic who prays or uh, vain repetitions or praying is what saves you. We're not saying that. But what we're saying right here is that in Romans 10, 13, based upon the belief that Jesus died, buried, resurrected to save your soul, if you were to pray that to the Lord, then you are saved. You might say that, no, I, I, I think that's not the case. No, call upon the name of the Lord. Look at Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. saved. And that is praying when we look at Genesis. But this calling upon the name of the Lord is based on verse 14. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? See, it's all based upon believing on Jesus Christ for yeah. salvation. Amen. So there's nothing wrong with using a sinner's prayer. Now, if you're using a sinner's prayer like a lot of these evangelistic meetings and Joel Osteen and these people, uh, repeat after me and then... They repeat, and then they said, you're saved, you're born again. No, some people who do that, they just repeat without even believing, without really understanding what they're believing in. See, so we're against that. So I understand that there's a false doctrine on, on that, but I'm against that. But let me tell you something. I'm against Paul Washer, too, and Ray Comfort, and these guys who discourage the sinner's prayer. Oh, yeah. I have zero respect. Amen. And people who draw on a whiteboard and then try to pretend that they're one of us when they... Uh, been split off from Bible believers, Dr. Upman Ministries, and then critique them and Jack Chicken, etc. Uh, and then you join in the line with Paul Washer, Ray Comfort. I have no respect for you. Okay? All right, let's go to Genesis 12. Verse 9. And Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. 
So notice right here, Abram, he continued journeying, traveling, still, and he was going southward. Now going on still toward the south. That means he's been going south, okay? Now you might say, why has he been going south? Because if you notice the direction from Haran and Ur of the Chaldees, it's uh, more on this side. So then he was going more toward the southern direction. Now here's something. Go to Hebrews 11. And then keep your hand here at Genesis because I want to read two verses here. Verse 10. And there was a famine in the land. So there's a famine in the land that Abram was at. And Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there. So Abram, he went to travel temporarily reside in Egypt because of the famine. For the famine was grievous in the land because the famine was very grievous. It was very bad uh, in the land. Now, this is important to understand when you look at Hebrews 11. Some people, they're going to give a false teaching that Abram went to Egypt because he had to have faith in the Lord that in spite of a wicked nation, he had to go by faith and stay there. No, that was a sin of Abram to go to Egypt. It wasn't because of faith. It was lack of faith. Faith was counted when he stayed in the land of Canaan. There was no faith when he's outside of Canaan. Now look at Hebrews 11. Why, you might say. Because Egypt is a type of the world in your Bible. It is not a good place to go to. God does not want his children to go into Egypt. Now, there were those exceptional cases that the Lord had Joseph go to Egypt and other places like that. But you have to understand that sometimes the Lord will use uh, something wrong for his glory. Sometimes he'll do that. But generally, generally in the Bible, you're going to notice God does not like Egypt. God does not want people to have anything to do with Egypt. Look at Hebrews 11. Notice at verse uh, 24, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to what? Enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That's worldliness, right? So notice Egypt was worldliness. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. That's very plain. Making that contrast with the worldliness of Egypt with Christian suffering, so to speak. Look at verse 27. By faith he what? Forsook, forsook Egypt. That's faith when yeah. you forsake Egypt. Yeah. Not when you go in there and embrace Egypt. Notice Abram is, uh, or Abraham in Hebrews 11. He was complimented for his faith when he stayed in Canaan, not when he left. Go to Hebrews 11 again, verse uh, 9. By faith, that's Abraham at verse 8, he sojourned in Egypt. No. Is that what it said? No. No. Now remember Genesis 12, he sojourned where? In Egypt. But God says his faith when he sojourned in what? In the land of promise. See, that's what God wanted him to stay. He didn't want him to go sojourn in Egypt. He wanted him to sojourn in Canaan. So Abram did not go out by faith when he went to Egypt. It's considered faith when he sojourns in Canaan, not in Egypt. All right, go back. Now notice then, this is how sin works. Or if Egypt is a type of the world, this is good preaching right here. Yeah. Notice right here that uh, Abram is a type of a Christian who uh, travels... Serving the Lord. So he goes out by faith and etc. So he travels onward, onward, onward. But then when he travels on for the Lord, the Lord says, this is it. Uh, th it's this land right here. But then as a Christian, we tend to keep traveling on. All right? We don't reside where God wants us to reside. Now, this is very dangerous. What happens is this. If you were to keep traveling on and not be content with where God wants you to be in, and what happens is, is that you're going to have this mentality, oh, God blessed me right here with this land. I wonder what it's like on the other side. 
So let me just keep going there because Abram sees a beautiful land of Canaan. And he's like, let's keep traveling south, see what it's more like. Yeah. No, he didn't have to do that. So verse 9, he kept still going toward the south. Then eventually, where did he hit Egypt? That's the danger, especially of uh, Christians who are second generation. When you reside where God has you reside in Canaan, don't get out of there. Yeah. Don't think, well, let me explore a little bit more. And then when you keep exploring further down there, then what happens is Egypt is closer to your sight. Yeah, and then where you are not of Egypt back then, but you've been compromising... See, step by step. Sin, you take uh, one step, it'll take you a mile. Yeah. There's a saying that goes that way. And then sin just grabs you, the world grabs you, and then you're like, oh, uh, I'm not going to live in there, in the world. I'm just going to sojourn in there. Yeah. I'm just going to experience and see what that's like. A lot of Christians have been hurt by that, second generation Christians, because they tasted the world. Now, this is really good preaching that you can do at summer camp or to Christian youth because that is an epidemic among Christian circles today, especially the uh, second generation. All right, uh, we'll cover the next part about what happened in Egypt with Abram and Sarai. God, my Father, I pray that today's teachings were a blessing to the hearers. We understood more of the scriptures and increased our knowledge. Dismiss us now with your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.